right, so um, before we get started uh, with today's work, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about your quizzes and response papers from last week. Uh, by and large, guys, the quizzes were kind of a train wreck. Several of you did all right, but a lot of you really, really bombed them. And so given what I saw in the response papers and that many of you were talking about parts of the epic that you weren't actually assigned to read, here's what I think happened. I remember when I asked how many of you have read the Odyssey before, a lot of you raised your hands and said you read it in high school, right? The fact that you read it in high school does not mean that you never need to read it again. Right? As you've probably already noticed, my focus in a lot of these texts is probably going to be pretty different from what a lot of your high school teachers did with you. And I'm, we're going to be concerned with very different things than a lot of your high school teachers were concerned with. So I hope that this sort of gets you on track to realizing that you are actually going to need to read everything whether or not you think you've already read it, okay? Right, be prepared for quizzes at any time. Now, as far as the uh, music that I was playing for you at the beginning of class is concerned, so this was an example of an ancient Greek musical form called dithyram. Um, and a dithyram usually also included uh, lyrics. Um, there would be a poem attached to it. Usually a hymn to the Greek god Dionysus. Anybody familiar with Dionysus? Who's Dionysus? Yeah, Corbin. Uh, I don't know if he's related to uh, wine and uh, that, 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 that Okay, yeah. One of the things in his godly portfolio, yes, is wine. But he is also associated with a number of ideas that the Greeks associated with wine. Right, so he is also a god of the sort of things that happen when you drink too much wine. Right, he is a god of <clears throat> unrestrained emotion. and a frenzy. Right? His most fanatical followers worked themselves up into these kind of ecstatic frenzies through uh, drinking, ingesting certain drugs, and through dance. So yeah, he's also very much associated with dance. And he's also a kind of god of foreignness. There was a theory uh, that Dionysus was actually a god who originated elsewhere in some other culture and was then adapted into the Greek pantheon. But <clears throat> the current thinking goes that he was actually always part of the Greek pantheon, but represented the other, right? represented something foreign. So... <clears throat> Given what we know about the Greeks and the sorts of things that they value, the sorts of things that they praise, right? They like logic, reason, measured and balanced debate. Does Dionysus seem like the kind of god that they would really be all that cool with much of the time? Seems out of character. He is out of character, yeah, very much out of character. So much so that the god's shrine, where the image of the god lived, was outside of the city walls. Right? Dionys the image of Dionysus, the idol of Dionysus, was excluded from the city. Right? It's kept outside. That's a thing we don't want in here, thank you. Except, once a year, when the festival in the gods' honor was held um, in the city of, a of Athens. And originally, 
this festival, well, okay, this festival always included taking the image of the god out of the shrine, parading it through the streets of Athens, uh, usually also waving phallic symbols around because Dionysus was also a fertility god, and this is in large part a fertility celebration. Uh, people singing songs, and then in the god's honor, choruses of 50 men would sing hymns in praise of Dionysus. These were called dithyrams. And each sort of little clan group within Athens did their own. They were written by different poets. And each was sponsored by a Koregos. A Koregos was a wealthy citizen who paid to have the dithyram, his particular clan's dithyram put on. And if his clan won the contest, then um, he would uh, get to erect a monument to himself um, in the city. So lucky him, right? So these dithyrams start out pretty simple, right? It's, it's, a, it's a poem put to music, and the music is rather simple, right? What was the instrumentation that you could hear in the audio clip that I played for you? Yeah, it's a flute mostly, right? That's the loudest and shrillest instrument. And it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really uh, conform to our idea of melody, right? We're sort of clearly looking at a, a different concept of what is and is not harmonious. Does everybody remember what the Greek flute was called? <laughs> we talked about this last time when we talked about uh, the Odyssey and what it looked like. The aulos, yes, good, Kathy, yes. So yeah, the instrument that you heard being played there, the, the main instrument was an aulos. And the rest of what you're hearing is mostly drums and bells. So it's fairly simple, it's really percussive, and it tends to build from something relatively slow to something a lot more kind of frenzied, right? as the dancers move, and as the dancers get faster. So these simple hymns to Dionysus eventually evolve into narratives. Um, a poet by the name of Thespis <coughs> from whose name we get the, the word thespian, right, for an actor, for a theater person, adds an actor who interacts with the chorus to his dithyram. Right, turns it into a story, turns it into a dialogue, right? The actor performs the part of a character, and the chorus sort of provides the voice of the community interacting with that character. So for some time, Greek drama as it evolved was essentially in this particular structure, right? One actor interacting with a large chorus. The playwright Aeschylus, who is an early contemporary of Euripides, who you read for today, right? Aeschylus is a much, much older guy, right? But they lived around the same time. Adds a second actor. And this allows for the telling of more complex stories. Aeschylus is slightly younger contemporary. Sophocles adds a third actor. So what this allows for is a kind of triangular scene. Right? You will never see in a Greek play more than three characters on stage at the same time. Because there were only three, there were the chorus by the time Euripides was writing, would have been made up of 12 men. But there would still only be three actors. Right? These three actors play multiple characters, but they, you know, they'll go off stage, they'll change into a different mask, and come back as somebody else. 
So, <clears throat> this contest in which these dithyrams were performed continues as these dithyrams evolve into plays. Right? And the winning playwright in this particular composite, uh, competition is given as a prize a goat or tragos. Right? Ancient Greek word for goat. Now, a goat, well, this is not a joke, right? A goat would have actually been extremely valuable um, in 5th century Athens. So, the etymology of our word tragedy, we think, comes from tragos, and it means something like goat song. Right? The song you write and perform in order to win a goat. Lucky you. So I know we have some theater people in here. Do any of you know anything about what Greek theater typically looked like? Kind of like a stage or a theater in the round of sorts, and usually outdoors. Yeah, it was always outdoors, always performed outdoors. <coughs> yeah, it was performed in an amphitheater. Yeah, it was in an amphitheater setting, right? So kind of theater in the round, but not all the way around, right? You would have a wall in the back, and in this wall were two doors. The wall was called a skena which is the uh, Greek word for tent. But by the time Euripides was writing, this was a permanent backdrop, right? Now, does anybody recognize a modern word in Skena? Scene, yeah. The two doors were called paradoi. The performance pit was called the orchestra, which literally means dancing place. And there would often be an altar set up in the front of the orchestra um, sort of to perform an animal sacrifice for a communal meal at the opening of the festival. And all around the orchestra right, would be rows and rows of seats, right, just stone benches on which the people of Athens would come to sit and view the plays. Right? And you know, these contests lasted for a couple of days, right? And this was sort of what you did for entertainment if you lived in ancient Athens, right? You gathered up the family, you packed a lunch, and you went to the city of Dionysia to watch the plays, right? Everybody came to these. Everybody showed up. And that was part of the point, right? It was a community building exercise as well. Right. The idea of the, this particular genre of plays, of tragedies, was to try to build the emotions of the audience, right, which again is made up of everybody in the community, to a kind of fever pitch in order to promote a sort of communal purging of negative emotions, right, what the, uh, what the philosopher Aristotle called catharsis. Right, so catharsis translates to purging. Right. Not literal purging, like, you know, vomiting, but, you know, purge, just, you know, pushing stuff out, right? Everybody gets all worked up and emotional. You have your good cry or your primal scream. And then you can go back to being very Greek and reasonable and rational and Spock-like for the rest of the year, right? 
That's the idea. Once a year, you come to the city Dionysia, you blow out all your emotions, and then you're good for the year. And the image of the god goes back to its shrine, and everybody just pretends this never happened. Mm -hmm. So basically this is a time of uh, making a lot of regrets but not regretting those regrets. Yeah, it's kind of a what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas kind of, kind of time, right? You know, Nobody's going to make fun of you if you're weeping or screaming at the end of Medea. But if you're still weeping and screaming two days later, then your neighbors are going to have some cause for complaint, right? Yeah, so remember, again, that Dionysus is a kind of god of emotional license, of, emo you know, of emotional unrestraint, and these are performed in his honor, right? So everything in these plays is designed to promote that kind of feeling of frenzy. Now, there's another element to this purging as well, which I think we'll sort of we'll get to as we go through the content of the play a little bit. Um, but what about the, uh, the gender makeup of Greek cast? Anybody know who the cast would be made up of? All men. All men, yeah. It was unseemly for women to go upon the stage. So the cast was made up entirely of even um, women's parts are always played by men. Um, and all of the actors wear masks. Right? Masks of wood, masks of clay, masks of terracotta, whatever's available, right? But yeah, they, and the different kinds of masks represent different sorts of characters, right? So there's a different sort of mask for a servant, or for a god, or for a king, or for a hero, right? Okay, everybody's still with me? Everybody following? Good. Okay, so, according to the great Greek philosopher Aristotle. <coughs> who wrote a lengthy treatise on drama called the Poetics. Of which we only have one volume. Apparently he wrote uh, a treatise on tragedy and a treatise on comedy. We only have the one on tragedy, but he says a few things about comedy in that. It's actually, it's even weird that we have the one on tragedy. Um, essentially, like, what the poetics is, is it's a set of ancient lecture notes, right? It's a record of a lecture Aristotle gave to his students um, on this subject that one of them just happened to write down. So that may very well be why we only have the one, the one half of it. But anywho, right, so in the Poetics, Aristotle argues that a tragedy is a play that is serious in nature, right, subject matter must be serious, and about elevated persons told in elevated language. So generally, a tragedy is going to be about your social betters, kings, queens, gods, heroes, and is going to be in a sort of high kind of artificial register of language, right? Advanced vocabulary kind of stuff. <laughs> So if you think, how many of you have, ever, have watched like a show like Downton Abbey? Okay, maybe you guys are a little bit young for caring about British people drinking tea. <laughs> okay, but it, it, it's, it's that sort of, if we're looking at that kind of social dynamic, you're looking at a tragedy would be about the aristocrats primarily, right? The people who sit around drinking tea and not, other, not otherwise doing much, um, and not so much about their servants. And it must have... Uh, certain parts. Uh, the first, <coughs> Aristotle calls mythos or plot. And the plot must pursue a single line of action 
right? No subplots in a Greek play. Things tend to move pretty quickly, right? They're usually fairly short. And there are very rarely any digressions, right? Like, how many of you have read uh, Shakespeare plays? Okay, you've at least had to read some Shakespeare in high school, right? You know how Shakespeare will often sort of mix multiple plots in a single play that all kind of come together at the end? Um, for the Greeks, that would have been considered an artistic flaw, right? They don't do that. Single line of action. The plot must also include a peripatia or reversal of fortune. Right. The lead character must experience, at some point, a change in fortune, either from bad to good or from good to bad. Right? And this is one thing to note about Greek tragedy. Right? We tend to think of a tragedy as something that always ends sadly or unhappily. Right? That was not the case with Greek tragedy. There are some Greek tragedies that have happy endings. The point is trying to reach this catharsis, this purging, right? Whether you get there by giving people a happy ending or a sad ending. Most of the tragedies that we have, that still exist, um, have unhappy endings. But that is really by the way. Second element, ethos or character. The character and by this we mean the lead character in the drama, must be neither wholly good nor wholly bad, right? They must be good enough that we can sympathize with them, but bad enough that they can still make enormous mistakes. Right. The character will indeed at some point make or commit hamartia or error in judgment, which leads to the reversal of fortune, the peripatia, right? A character must also be consistent. Now, Aristotle means this in two senses. Uh, one, Everything that the character does must make sense in terms of the plot, right? Everything the character does must be consistent with logic and reason. Right? The character won't do anything that is unreasonable. It seems to come out of nowhere. Right? It seems just to be out of character. The character must also be consistent with pre-existing audience expectations of that character. Did the Greeks invent plots for their plays? Does anybody know? No. They did not, right? Yeah, they typically used subjects from mythology and history, right? So the audience would already be familiar with the story that the play tells. The audience would already know basically what was going to happen. They would be familiar with these characters. Now, sometimes particularly skilled playwrights would give you a twist on the expected story. Uh, for example, in Euripides' uh, version of the Medea story, right, he seems to have invented the idea that Medea knowingly and willingly kills her children. Right? In previous versions of the myth, the deaths of the children were accidental. Euripides is the first person to make this an on-purpose kind of thing. So that's just an example of the way playwrights would often alter a familiar story um, to give the audience some kind of sense of shock, right? <clears throat> All right, other elements that were required in a play. Dianoia, or thought. Now what this means, it doesn't just mean that the characters are thinking. What it means is that they're thinking out loud, right? That all of their thoughts are expressed to the audience. Did you notice very many stage directions in this play? 
there are very, very few stage directions, right? Yes. And the reason for this is that any stage directions that we see here are actually modern interpolations, right? Modern translators sticking those in there because they think this is where a character would do something. The actual ancient Greek manuscripts contain no stage directions at all. The plays are written entirely in dialogue. So we kind of have to guess based on dialogue, right? <coughs> what characters are supposed to do. And yeah, that's what this dianoia means, right, is that all of the characters' thoughts are expressed to the audience. They don't hold anything back. A play must also contain melos, music, right? All Greek plays were musical, but not in the sense that we would think of a music where you know, singing and dancing and jazz hands, right? <clears throat> there would be dance, yes, and there would be music, and most of the dialogue would be chanted. But people didn't just sort of like break into song uh, in mid-speech. And finally, opsis, or spectacle. The Greeks actually did have special effects for these plays. Um, you know, sometimes these would be as simple as a painted backdrop, um, or elaborate costumes. But there was also um, a cart that would be wheeled on stage to show dead bodies. <coughs> right. No, not real ones. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. No one's getting murdered here, right, for real. <laughs> no, but what, what, like, characters in a Greek play, like, they're violent, right? These plays are really violent. But does any of the violence occur on stage? Never, right? You know, when Medea kills her children, for example, right? When she kills the princess, these things don't happen in front of our eyes. They're reported to us by another character, right? That messenger shows up and tells us what happened. So this cart would be pulled out with the corpse, with, you know, with a couple of people lying on it that are supposed to represent the corpses of these dead characters. Um, there was also um, a crane called a mechana that was used to raise and lower actors from the stage. So like actors playing a god who was either coming down to the stage from the heavens or going up into the heavens from the stage would be lifted up by this crane. How many of you ever heard the phrase deus ex machina? Okay, a couple of you, right? What it literally means is God from the machine. And <clears throat> that term comes from these Greek plays where gods would be brought onto and off the stage using this, this, this crane, right? And what does deus ex machina mean uh, in the modern usage? Yes, yeah, Seth? It's pretty much some. It's pretty much um, a plot, something that happens in the plot that where some where some where some help comes for the hero, uh -huh. and some come out of complete nowhere. There's no logical explanation for yeah. it to actually uh, be there, but it's there right. because plot. It's like 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 a shit. I wrote myself into a corner, kind of situation, right? And somebody, some someone or something more powerful has to sh just show up and fix things, right? For no apparent good reason. Yeah, you see this a lot in movies and TV, right? So, yeah, that's where that comes from. Um, now, in this particular play, the Makane, the crane, would be used in that final scene where Medea is riding the sun god's chariot to escape, right? Carrying the bodies of her children. So that's what the Makane would have been used for. Like, uh, Medea would have actually been a pretty sort of spectacle-filled play uh, by Greek standards, right? It would have relied very, very heavily on these visual effects. Okay, so we have some sense now of sort of what this play would have looked like and what a Greek playwright is supposed to be aiming for, right? So let's delve a little bit into uh, the actual content of the play. What did you guys think of this? How'd this go for you? I liked it. Okay, you, you Very liked it. Compelling, <laughs> okay. mastery. I've never read it before. Okay. 
What did you find particularly compelling, Sarah? Um, it's very modern. It felt very much more modern than, you know, ancient Greek culture or what it has to say about the relationships between men and women. Okay. What's particularly, okay, what specifically struck you as modern about this? <laughs> and if anybody else wants to chime in, feel free. <laughs> it kind of talks about how it's not right for, uh, it sucks for her because she can't go to anybody else for comfort, but mm -hmm. her husband can do whatever he wants. Yeah, let's actually go to that speech. Right, if you look on page 792, can I get a, can I get a Medea, can I get a volunteer to read from Of All the Living Creatures with a Soul? All right, Kathy, go for it. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, so what differences in gender roles is Medea pointing out here? How are the expectations for men different from the expectations for women? Little expectations for men. They don't have too much to hold themselves up to in the marriage. It kind of seems like. Mm -hmm. In marriage, expectations for men are low, right? Yes. Yes, in a marriage relationship, expectations for men are relatively low. Right. Remember how, like, how's the oikos divided up? How's the Greek household divided up? Private, private portion of the house for women, public portion of the house for men, right? So men are expected to go out and have friends and be social and do stuff, right? Do stuff out in public. Women are expected to stay home, <coughs> weave, cook, raise children, um, do the, the sort of various things that were ascri you know, ascribed to women's work, right? In the house, right? If they know anybody else around, they know they're near neighbors. So <clears throat> what else does she point out about Greek marriage here? Yeah, that essentially you pay for a husband, right? Or your family does, right? Your family pays someone to marry you, right? Along with a wife, a husband gets a dowry. To refuse him is just not possible. When a girl leaves home and comes to live with new ways, different rules, she has to be a prophet, right? So the girl leaves her family, comes to live with her husband's family, and has to learn how to adjust to them, right? She's expect, she is now part of the husband's family, is expected to behave as they do, to do what they do. Um, now... <coughs> Sexual mores were also much looser for men than they were for women. Right now, we talked a little bit about this last time we discussed the Odyssey, right? And I think this is one thing that we need to understand. Like, one of the first responses I usually get to this from students is people complaining about Jason cheating on 
Medea. And from a, the ancient Greek standpoint, Jason is perfectly within his rights. From the ancient Greek standpoint, he can discard his wife and take another. There's nothing legally to stop him from doing that. Medea has no right to interfere with that. Yeah, Kathy? When you say discard, do you mean like divorce or like she's just in the house but he doesn't take care of her she's inside and then he has the other woman or whatever? Either way. Basically, men could sleep with, whatever, with whoever or whatever they wanted to. That was the way the society worked. Right? Very much, politically anyway, a male-dominated society. Right? The rules were different for men than they were for women. Now, Medea has something else that makes her unusual as well. Right? How else is she, how is she different from other women even in the play? She's a foreigner, yeah. She's clever. Clever in the same way that her aunt, Circe, was clever, right? Anybody remember this with polypharmacon from last week? What's polypharmacon? Many drugs. Many drugs, yes. She is skilled in the use of herbs, drugs, poisons, compounds, right? And this makes her a source of fear to her neighbors, to the powers that be in the city of Corinth, right? But yeah, I think, uh, Wallace, you mentioned as well that she's also a foreigner, right? She's not Greek. In fact, she's often referred to throughout the play as a barbarian, right? And it is noted when the children go and take the presents to the princess, right, that they are golden-haired. Are there a lot of golden-haired Greeks running around? No. Yeah, Greeks are typically dark-haired. Right, so if the children are blonde, that's an indication that they come from some other sort of <coughs> bar barbaric lineage, right? It's the mark of their mother on them. So Medea is in a particularly strong bind here, right? Her husband has left her in a city where she has no real friends or connections. Can she go back home? No. Why not? She killed her brother. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's history there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so. How many of you know the story of the Golden Fleece? Any of you familiar with that myth? Eh, a little bit? Yeah. Okay, what do you know about it? Anybody, go ahead. The Golden Fleece uh, fosters life wherever it is, basically. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a fertility symbol, yeah. yeah. As just about everything in myth is. Okay, so Jason is the rightful heir to a kingdom called Yolkus. His uncle kicked his father off the throne and is ruling as a tyrant. When Jason returns from exile, the uncle says he'll give up the throne if Jason goes off to this barbaric country called Colchis on the other side of the Black Sea. Colchis is uh, where the modern nation of Georgia is now. Um, and brings back this golden fleece, right? He can have the throne if he brings the golden fleece back. Now, uncle is thinking, okay, yeah, there's no way he's going to get this. I'm never going to see him again. He's going to die out there. But when Jason gets out to Colchis, Medea, the king's younger daughter, falls in love with him and essentially performs all of the trials he's supposed to perform to get the fleece for him. Right. She tells him how to defeat her father's warriors. She drugs the dragon that guards the fleece. And then as they're running away, she kills and dismembers her own brother, dropping the body parts behind 
so that her father will stop to pick them up and give them time to get away. So there's no going home here, right? Not only has she stolen her father's most prized possession, she has also murdered a member of her own family for Jason's sake, right? She did it for him. Now, once they get back to Yolkus and Uncle Pelias doesn't want to give up his throne, what does Medea do to him? Does anybody know? Not what she does trick his daughters into killing him, right? She says that if they boil him in this cauldron, right, it'll boil all the all the old age off of him and he'll be young and strong again, right? So apparently they're not very clever. And they put him in the pot and boil him, and the expected thing happens, right? You know, he does not in fact age backwards. No, he boils to death. So they can't go back to corn. They can't go back to Yolkus either, right? So, what do these two incidents have in common? What is Medea a destroyer of? She's a destroyer of families, yeah. <coughs> she's, destro she's destroyed her own family. And she destroyed King Pelias' family in Yolkus, right? So, she has a history of breaking apart the Oikos, right? She has a history of breaking apart the Greek household. And this makes her threatening, right? This makes her scary. This makes her dangerous. Which is not to say that she isn't the wrong party here, right? Let's look at uh, the argument that she has with Jason. I'm going to need uh, two volunteers here, uh, from, starting from page 797. I need a Jason and a Medea. Anybody? All right. Okay, Jason, Medea. All right, Seth, so start from, this is not the first time. Okay. Uh, Around, uh, near the bottom of the page. Okay. This is not the first time. I have often observed that a fierce temper is an evil that leaves you no recourse. You should. You could have stayed here in, in this land. You could have kept your home by simply, oh, hi, word. Acquiescing. <laughs> Acquiescing. Acquiescing, thank you. <laughs> by simply acquiescing in the plans of those who are greater. You are now in exile because of your own foolish words. To me, it makes no difference. You can keep on calling Jason the very worst of men. However, the words you spoke against the royal family, well, Consider it a game that nothing worse than exile is your punishment. As for me, I wanted you to stay. You always tried to calm the king to soothe his fuming rage. But you, you idiot, you would not <laughs> let up your words against the royal family. That's why you are now in exile. All the same, I won't let down my loved ones. I have, I have come here looking out for your best interests, woman. So you won't be without the things you need when you go into exile with the children. You'll need money. Banishment means hardship. How, however much you hate me, I could never wish you any harm. Okay, so thing to note here before Vivica gets started, right? Does Jason accept any blame no. for what has <laughs> happened here? No. Whose fault is all of this? Yeah. Right? It's your stupid fault, barbarian woman, right? Yes. All right, Vivica, go ahead. You are the worst. You're loathsome. That's the worst word I can utter. You're not a man. You've come here, most detested by the gods, by me, by all mankind. This isn't courage. When you have the nerve to harm your friends, then look them in the face. No, that's the worst affliction known to man, shamelessness. And yet, I'm glad you've come. Speaking ill to you will ease my soul, and listening will cause you pain. I'll start at the beginning. First, I saved your life, as every single man who sailed from Hellas aboard the Argo knows. When you were sent to yoke the fire-breathing bulls and sow the deadly crop, 
I killed the dragon too, the sleepless one, who kept the golden fleece and folded in his <coughs> convoluted. convoluted coils. I was your light, the beacon of your safety. For my part, I betrayed my home, my father, and went with you to Pelion Slopes. Yolkus. What was it? Yolkus. Yolkus, <coughs> mm -hmm. with more good than wisdom. And I killed Pelas in the cruelest possible way, at his own children's hands. I ruined their household. And you, you are the very worst of men. Betrayed me after all that. You wanted a new bed, even though I'd borne your, you children. If you had to, if you had still been childless, anyone could understand your lust for the new marriage. All trust in oaths is gone. What puzzles me is whether you believe those gods, the ones who heard you swear, no longer are in power, or that the old commandments have been changed. You realize full well you broke your oath. Ah, my right hand, which you took so often, clinging to my knees. What was the point of touching me? You are despicable. My hopes have all gone wrong. Well, then, you are here. I have a question for you, friend to friend. What good do I imagine it will do? Still, I'll ask, since it makes you look worse. Where do I turn now? To my father's household and fatherland, which I betrayed for you? Or Peleus' poor daughters? Naturally, they'll welcome me, the one who killed their father. Here is my situation. I've become an enemy to my own family, those whom I should love and I have gone to war with, those whom I had no reason at all to hurt, and all for your sake. In exchange, you've made me the happiest girl in all of Hellas. I have you, the perfect spouse, a marvel, so trustworthy, though I must leave the country friendless and deserted, taking with me my friendless children. What a charming scandal for a newlywed. Your children roam as beggars. With with the one who saved your life. Zeus, her brass disguised as gold, you sent us reliable criteria to judge. But when a man is based, how can we know? Why is there no sign stamped upon his body? Okay, thank you. You can stop there. Um, okay, so what does she point out to Jason here? Yeah, she lists a catalog, right, of all of the things that she has done for this piece of shit, right? <laughs> Everything that she has done for him. Everything that he owes her. And is it just things that she's done for him? I mean, she points out that, like, everybody else knows that she did it for him, too. Right. <laughs> and that she sacrificed things for him, too, right? She sacrificed her own family. Now, according to Greek marriage custom, right, if a, wo if a woman's husband decides to divorce her, where is she supposed to go? Back home, Back home right? Back to the family. However. <laughs> yeah. This is not an option for her, right? She cannot do this for reasons we've already discussed. Um, the only recourse, by the way, that a Greek woman had legally for divorce was if her husband was physically abusive. Right? If, he was, if her husband was physically abusive and she had living male relatives she could go to, then she could, <coughs> she could leave legally. She could end the marriage legally then. Otherwise, she was stuck with him until he decided to throw her away. So, what about page 799? She talks about, ah, my right hand, which you took so often clinging to my knees, what was the point of touching me? What's she suggesting about Jason there? Was a supplicant. Yeah, that's that gesture of the supplicant again, right? And, <laughs> yeah, no, probably not what you're thinking of. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Basically, he kept putting himself in her power, right? And she kept serving as benefactor to him. Right? She welcomed him as a stranger in her land. She helped him achieve everything he needed to achieve. And then this is how he repays her, right? This is how he thanks her for that. Now, can I get... Um, Two more volunteers. Can I get another Jason and another Medea?
to continue this little argument. <coughs> All right. So we got a Medea. Can we get another Jason? Somebody who hasn't read yet. Anybody? <laughs> All right. Go for it, Wallace. Okay. So Jason from. It seems that I must have a way with words. It seems that I must have a way with words, and like the skillful captain, reef my sails in order to escape this gale blows without a break. Your endless tired harangue. Harangue. The way I see it, woman, since you seem to feel that I must owe you some huge favor, it was Cyprus, no other god or mortal who saved me on my voyage. Yes, your mind is subtle, subtle, but I must say, at the risk of stirring up your envy and your grudges, Eros was the one who forced your hand. His arrows, which are inescapable, compelled you to rescue me. But I won't put too fine a point on that. You did support me. You saved my life, in fact. However, you received more than you gave. As I shall prove, first of all, you live in, he you live in Hellas now, instead of your barbarian land. With us, you know what justice is and civil law, not mere brute force. And every single person in Hellas knows that you are wise. You're famous. You never have the kind of reputation, you never have that kind of reputation if you were living at the edge of nowhere. As for me, I wouldn't wish for gold or for a sweeter song than Orpheus unless I had the fame to match my fortune. Okay, we pause there for a moment. Now, we notice the beginning of Jason's speech, right? He starts with this, like a skillful captain metaphor, right? This sort of ship sailing metaphor. Um, which is supposed to prepare us for the bullshit to come, right? <laughs> now, <clears throat> what arguments does he make to her here? It was the God that made her fall in love with him, not and, her own free will. Yes, that if he owes anybody, he owes Aphrodite, right, for making Medea fall in love with him. Now, what else? Is there anything particularly ironic about his little speech here? He makes us snide comment that says, since you seem to feel like I owe you some huge favor. Uh-huh. So, like, he just puts more emphasis on the fact that he's telling her, I don't owe you anything, I owe the gods. Yeah. Okay, it's the gods who brought me, it's the gods who saved me. He's saying that all the sacrifices she made for him gave her a reputation that she should be thankful for. Oh, yeah, everybody, yeah, you're famous. Everybody knows how smart you are, right? That's part of the problem. <laughs> Everybody knows how smart she is it's because of all the people she's used her brains to kill, right? So she's going to have a hard time finding welcome in most other places. Um, what else? Like, what does he claim she gained from their relationship? She gained us. So, oh, yeah. yeah. You get to live in Greece now instead of your barbarian hellhole, right? Lucky you. Right? With us, you know what justice is in civil law, not mere brute force. Anything kind of ironic about that? There is no civil justice or law. Yeah, I mean, it's the law, right, that has put her into this position in the first place. It's Greek law that treats women and foreigners differently that has put her into this difficult spot. So... Yeah, maybe standards of living are a little bit higher in Corinth than in Colchis, but the trade-off doesn't quite seem to work out for her, right? If she just, you know, if she had stayed in Colchis, she wouldn't be having the problems that she's having now. Now, <clears throat> can I get you to uh, continue, please, Wallace, from Enough About My Struggles? <laughs> Enough about my struggles. You're the one who started this debate. As for my marriage to the princess, which you hold against me, I shall show you how I acted wisely and with restraint and with the greatest love toward you and toward our children. Wait, just listen. When I moved here from Oikos, bringing with me disaster in abundance with no recourse, what more luckily 
what more lucky windfall could I find, exiled that I was, than marrying the king's own child. It's not that I despise your bed, the thought that irritates you the most, nor was I mad with the longing for a new bride or trying to compete with anyone to win the prize for having the most children. I have enough, no reason to complain. My motive was the best, so we live well and not be poor. I now, I know that everyone avoids a needy friend. I wanted to raise sons in a style that fits my family background. Give brothers to the ones I had with you and treat them all as equals. This would strengthen the family and I'd be blessed with fortune. <clears throat> what do you need children for? For me, though, it's good if I can use my future children to benefit my present one. Is that bad planning? If you weren't so irritated about your bed, you'd never say it was, but you're a woman and you're all the same. If everything goes well between the sheets, you think you have it all. But <laughs> <laughs> well, let there be some setback or disaster in the bedroom and suddenly you go to war against the things that you should value most. I mean it, man should really have some other method for getting children. The whole female race should exist. It's nothing but a nuisance. Okay, so what Jason is doing here, right, what he's playing on is a set of Greek gender stereotypes, right? The basic idea is that a man is supposed to be logical, rational, unemotional, chaste and restrained, right? Not motivated by baser <clears throat> passions, right? Motivated by higher reason. Whereas the Greek stereotype of a woman is as illogical, emotional, and oversexed. What is oversexed? Basically like, like sort of hypersexual, like just like like obsessed with um, obsessed with sex. Right? And so this is the thing he's talking about. He talks about Medea being obsessed with what happens in the bedroom, right? Insisting that the only thing she cares about is that he's not having sex with her anymore. Right? That he's going and having sex with someone else. I mean, that might be kind of true because every time they argue, she always brings up the point of he's having sex with somebody else. And well, somebody else but think about the other reasons she has to be upset here, right? He seems to insist that this is her primary motivation. However, she's in a foreign country where she has no rights. She's being sent into exile by the king, right? She has two small children. Um, and no, you know, no friends or family to call on or go to, right? So there are plenty of logical, rational reasons for her to be upset about his marriage that have nothing to do with sex, right? If she was Greek, would there be any protections in place to keep this one from happening? It would be more likely that she would have family nearby that she could go to. Now, granted, you know, if she murdered them, <laughs> that, pro that would still probably be an issue, right? But, you know, the other thing about Medea, too, is like the thing that makes her atypical um, is her, her cleverness, right? That makes her atypical for both men and women is that she is highly intelligent and can look at her situation rationally and can effectively debate with Jason as well, right? If we look at the way this exchange between them is structured, right, what does it look like? You know, they're both listing points of argument, right? Usually, like, if it was any other woman, like, that it was a Greek woman, then Jason would be able to, like, pretty much just up and leave, and they would just go back home, and there wouldn't be this, all this drama and everything. But because she mm -hmm. understands everything, yeah. that's why, that's uh -huh. the problem. Like you said a few minutes ago, she's freaking smart, and that's, that's the problem. Yeah. She can effectively debate him, right? She can effectively challenge him. And, and to that end, um, Sarah, can you read uh, Medea's part from uh, 801, right? From Now this is where I differ from most people. And now this is where I differ from most people. In my view, someone who is both unjust and has a gift 
for speaking. Such a man incurs the greatest penalty. He uses his tongue to cover up his unjust actions, and this gives him the nerve to stop at nothing, no matter how outrageous. Yet he's not all that wise. Take your case, for example. Spare me this display of cleverness. A single word will pin you to the mat. If you weren't in the wrong, you would have told me your marriage plans, not kept us in the dark, your loved ones, your own family. Yeah, you can keep going, Wallace. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, of course. You would have been all for it. Even now, you can't control your rage against the marriage. That's not what you were thinking. You imagine that for an older man, a barbarian wife is lacking in prestige. No. Please believe me. It wasn't for the woman's sake I married into the king's family. As I have said, I wanted to save you and give our children the royal brothers a safeguard for our household. It did it for us, baby. <laughs> <laughs> May I not have a life that's blessed with fortune so painful or prosperity so irritating? Your prayer could be much wiser. Don't <coughs> consider what's useful, painful, when you have good fortune. Don't see it as hard. To. So what he's trying to counsel here is exactly this kind of like, be logical and unemotional, right? Think about the advantages of the situation. Don't put your feelings into this, right? He's playing into this Greek male stereotype here. Now the other thing I want to point out here is like, if we look at the top of the page, um, Jason's speech there, is there anything that strikes you as weird about what he says to Medea about children? Uh, they should have different ways of getting children. Okay, <laughs> they should have different ways of, ways of getting children. If we go further up, what do you need children for, right? Yeah, he needs children, exactly, to carry on his family lineage, right? The line is passed through the male. And he says, like, what difference does it make to you, right? You're a woman. What do you need children for? Now, <clears throat> this is also important for other reasons. <clears throat> Why, in the end, must Medea kill the children? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is how she's getting to him, right? If he has no children and no new wife, what does this mean? His family line ends. Yeah, family line ends with him. No legacy. He leaves nothing behind, right? When he dies, that's it. That's why this is the most effective way she can get at him, right? It is messed up, yeah. <laughs> but it's also perfectly logical and unemotional, right? Removing her own feelings about it from the equation, right? If I am to get revenge on my piece of shit of an ex-husband, right? What is the best way that I can hurt him not just in this life, but in the life beyond. And the way to do that is to make sure that the line dies with him. To make sure that he leaves no legacy. Nothing behind. Right, if we look at her prophecy at uh, the end of the play here, Page 821, right, he says, let me bury their bodies, let me grieve, forget it. I will take them away myself and bury them with this hand in the precinct sacred to Hera of the Rocky Heights. No enemy will treat their graves with outrage. To this holy land of Sisyphus I bequeath a holy festival, a ritual to expiate in times to come this most unholy slaughter. So she won't even allow him to touch the bodies or to bury the children, right? He's like, no, as far as we're concerned, you're done with them. No closure of any kind for you. I myself will go to live together with Pandion's son Aegeus in Erechtheus' city, and you, an evil man as you deserve, will die an evil death struck on the head by a fragment of the Argo. You will see how bitter was the outcome of my marriage. So she prophesies that the ship that carried him to fame, right, the ship that carried him across the Black Sea to go find the Golden Fleece, now rotting on the shore, is going to fall apart and kill him. 
right? A plank is going to, rotten plank is going to fall on his head and he's going to die. And that's a, an ignominious end for a once shining hero, right? So not only does she want him to suffer, right? She wants him to be utterly humiliated and destroyed. Nothing left for him. And that's the point as well, sort of doing what she does to the children, right? So <clears throat> one thing sort of to note about this is that, like, I've, I often get the response from students that Medea is acting crazy sort of through much of the play. But if we look at the way she reasons, right, everything she does is calculated. And while what she does at the end of the play is cruel, Right? It also makes perfect sense. Right? She wavers a bit emotionally, but she does things she does things that are calculated to have the greatest impact on her enemies. So again, I'm not gonna deny that the end of the play is kind of you know shocking and harsh and cruel. And why is it that she's able to get away with it? Yeah, this is actually um, a couple. Just one thing to say about Euripides' plays generally, right? Euripides was a playwright who was really popular with audiences in Athens. We can we one thing that can attest to his popularity is that more manuscripts of his plays survive than any other Greek playwright. But we also know that he only won the prize four times, despite having written about 90 plays and thus having participated um, in the city of Dionysia probably 30 times. So the more culturally conservative judges tended not to like his work for a variety of reasons. Right? One, He makes traditional heroes look bad. He tends to paint characters who are regard, typically regarded as heroic in a negative light. And remember, one of the things we said about you know, Aristotle's recommendations for character, right, is they need to be consistent with, with, with what people already think of them. He tends to write with a great deal of sympathy, more so than other uh, playwrights of the same era, uh, for women foreigners. <coughs> not foreigner, not 70s soft rock super good foreigner. <coughs> yeah, he tends to uh, elevate women and foreigners to major, and note that much of this play, like much of the early dialogue in the play, which we learn the situation, is in the mouths of servants. Right. A lot of the information we get in this play is from servants, not from the upper level folk. And finally, from his often negative representations of the gods. Right, I mean, you know, Helios, the sun god here, drops his chariot to earth to carry Medea away, despite she's just, the fact that she's just committed a pretty heinous murder. For what reason? That's like his granddaughter. <clears throat> she's his granddaughter, yeah. She's family. Right, she does have one relative she can count on. <laughs> well, she does have one relative she can go back to. But yeah, the, the point there, and the thing that tended to piss judges in this competition off about Euripides is that the gods help people for arbitrary reasons, right? Like, Helios here helps her because she's family, not because she's virtuous, right? And the judges often seem to be more interested in the promotion of civic virtue uh, than audiences who actually enjoyed Euripides' plays uh, were. All right, so we are about out of time. Does anybody have any questions about any of this?
Were women allowed to go see the play? Oh yeah, everybody went to the place. Yeah, women, children, everybody. Yeah. If Medea didn't have a whole, any family to go back to, does that would that also include her aunt Cersei, who turned skies into pigs a lot? She well, sir, do we get the impression that Cersei's island is easy to get to? Fair. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean... I thought I'd ask a real question first. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I have some reading questions for you for next time. We're going to be reading uh, poems by uh, Sappho, who is the only uh, known female poet of ancient Greece. So once you've got what you need here, you are free to go. Oh, and I have to give your quizzes back to you. <laughs> <laughs>